What's up, everybody? How you guys doing? Uh, welcome to another Road Reflection. This is I'm your host, Chris Mohan. If you're unfamiliar with who I am, leaving a little early. We're doing a... Uh, uh, this might be slightly longer pending <laughs> pending graphic. Uh, it... Because it's snowing in Pittsburgh, where where I am, and um, yeah, which means that people people on the road are gonna get a little little antsy pantsy, uh, and you might notice that there's a, a little bit, I guess, a little difference in the in the view of of this stuff, uh, and that is because. I had to, um, <laughs> my mount broke, <laughs> so I, I had to jury rig something, and it's actually, I mean, it worked out pretty well, it's not bad, if you ask me, uh, so that's why things look a little different, and that's why things will probably look a little different when I do these, uh, these car casts, if you want to call them that, um, We'll start with our we'll start with our check in as we always do in the first few minutes of these is start with a check in. Boy, it's been a fucking shit show week, you guys. Uh, I m- one of my hard drives is failing. One of my external hard drives is is failing. Um, kind of just happened over uh, over the course of the last. Two days, maybe. Uh, I'm recording this on Tuesday afternoon. Um, this might not come out until the following day. I'm, I'm, I'm not particularly sure. It's really going to depend on how my computer is going to be uh, available to me. <laughs> uh, yeah, but it's it's been very frustrating and difficult because I basically had to take. Um, this might be a little bit of explaining in terms of like the inner workings of my head and how I've been working uh, off files and stuff like that. But I work off of this external hard drive because every time that um, I've worked off of my computer, I always seem to run out of space very, very quickly because I work with large files, right? I work with the video, audio, and uh, bigger design files when I do design projects. Uh, it takes up a lot of power on my computer. It takes up a lot of space on my computer. So I decided maybe, you know, six, seven years ago, something something like that. So I've been doing, I've been working like this for a while. Then I'm going to work off of my hard drive. Uh, and then I will, I will have a double backup for all files, right? So I have some working files um, on, on hard drive A. And then hard drive B is like my big fucking backup file or backup hard drive, Um, and hard drive A is super old, and is, and is failing, and over the summer, I had some issues, and they, and I talked to a few Apple techs, uh, because I wasn't sure if it was a software problem, or a hardware problem, and uh, there was this error code, called error code 36, that would pop up, and it would basically, like, when I talked to the Apple people, they were like, yo, we don't know what this fucking error code is. Like, people have talked to us about it, but there's, like, no answer as far as what error code 36 is. It's just sort of this catch-all error code of, like, when it could be uh, anything that's wrong with the computer. And we have to run, like, way more intensive scans and shit like that on it. Um, but they were like, let's try to, you know, let's try to cross off a few things um, to make sure that it's not one thing or the other so they did a bunch of like software shit and you know basically what what happened was on Saturday or no on Sunday I was putting up um, I was putting up a a podcast working off GarageBand and it's just like it was it was a shit show to try to get it to work and I moved the file off that hard drive onto the desktop And everything was good to go. So I was like explaining it. And the dude was like, yeah. So we went through, I mean, we went through a bunch of stuff. Like it was like an hour and a half phone call. Um, And we went through a bunch of stuff. And he was like, yeah, it seems like GarageBand is fine. Like there's one weird little thing that pops up. A little dialogue box that pops pops up. But it's it's not something that should catastrophically be affecting your computer. Um, Or, or like the way that your computer operates 
so it's probably something else. And I brought up this hardware hard drive thing, and he was like, oh, yeah, possibly. And this is like an eight-year-old hard drive. <laughs> Uh, so, you know, it's, it's like in, it's on its way out and, and I never got confirmation that that was the problem. I just thought maybe there was a corrupted file, uh, that was creating a couple issues and I found a way to get rid of one of the files that I thought was corrupted. And, uh, it turns out that wasn't the problem. It turns out that the, the hard drive itself, the mechanics, the physical parts, the moving elements within a hard drive are failing. Um, and, you know, I so immediately, like, my girlfriend and I went and looked for a hard drive, and she was able to grab one for me with free shipping and all this other stuff, right? And, and that's awesome, and that's great, and I'm, I'm, I'm glad, but I still have to, like, back up a whole bunch of fucking things. Um, and usually, like, I back things up about every week. Uh, maybe a week and a half, maybe a little bit, a little bit more than that. But usually, it's about every week. I back up what I've got. I've back up the folders that I know I've worked on, and so on and so forth. It helps me keep things in order. It helps me know that things are secure. Like things operating in the background don't particularly need to operate in the background, and so on and so forth. So I felt like, okay, cool. Like this is this is good. Uh, and then. Basically, I have like one or two large files, but it keeps thinking that these files are corrupt. Keep, it keeps giving me error code 36, so I've had to come up with creative ways to do it, and it's taking up a lot more of my time. So obviously, I've had to get in touch with a bunch of people that um, you know I do work for. I when I like I've, I picked up some freelance design gigs that like I can't do anything because I've got these large processors going in the background to like back up a bunch of my files to back up a bunch of like, you know, final cut files and shit like that, which are like hundreds of gigs. Um, and I've, I've heard the arguments about cloud storage and this, that, and the third, and that's all fun and great. And, and I'm sure that it's got a lot of value, but right now one, like adding even a little tiny extra monthly expense, not particularly conducive to me. Um, two, making a hard case for that constantly over and over again uh, is only going to stress me out a, a, like a lot more like it did today. Um, and I know these people are coming from a, a place of good, but like I'm already overwhelmed. I'm already frustrated about this thing. Like, let me get through this. You know, like I would much rather somebody come up and be like, hey, when you're ready to talk about like alternative storage stuff, like once you get this hard drive set up and you want to talk about some alternative storage options, uh, let's do that. Um, you know, I heard, I heard your case. I've heard what... So like on top of this other stressful thing, I've got like another stressful thing of how do I get people to understand what I'm... What, like what's going on and to just give me space, right? A lot of... A, a lot of a lot of ways to, for, for me personally to get over stress and depression and anxiety and like being overwhelmed is just like, yo, give me the space to get this done. Um, and let's not add another task on top of the tasks that I already have that are falling behind because of this other priority task that's taking, like, it's just too much and now you're adding more to it. It's cool, I get it, and I can look into it, but that's not where I'm at and you gotta like stop fucking harping on it. And I wish people would get that. <laughs> to be like, hey, I need some space to get this thing done. I'm notifying you that I'm in the middle of this really like frustrating and annoying thing. But don't don't come at me with like, okay, here's that. And I know like I've gotten, I, I do that too because it's all about problem solving, but sometimes it's like, I'm, I'm all about that long-term problem solving, but let me get through this one thing first, um, and, then we'll, and then we'll talk about like long-term solutions. I'm totally in for it. Uh, but give me a little space, and if I can't, get, if I can't do that long-term solution, hear, hear me out and understand where I'm coming from, and eventually maybe I'll get to it. But, you know, people just, they're, they're just like, I have this thing and you should try it and it's awesome. It's the best. And if you don't, then it's awful and you're never going to get, like, it's, it's just too much and too overwhelming. And, you know, like I said, right now, it's like, I don't have all of my income. Like, I have, I have my sustaining members. I have a couple other things that I do to, like, earn, like, side hustle stuff that I do to, like, earn an income to 
pay my bills and keep up on top of that, but it's like adding more shit. Like I already have to pay for hosting fees and streaming fees, like just to keep up on my channel to maintain some semblance of content creation and like presence. And I'm constantly getting censored and it's like, I have to battle that. And I like, and then I have to do all of this other stuff to like get my content out there. And then I have all this side hustle stuff and then I have to maintain a personal, like it's a lot to do already. And this thing is already hindering basically all of that. Uh, so adding more on top of it of like, do this and research this and research, like I get it, but you got to like fucking back off a little bit and give me a little bit of time to, but, and, and it's really, really hard. It's really, really hard when I, and again, it's like, I get the, I get the benefits of cloud storage and all of that stuff. So if people are going to mention that in the comment sections or what have you, that's nice, but just fucking hold off. Cause I'm already in a high stress situation. All right. I've already talked about this for like way too fucking long. Um, but that's where I'm at. I'm very, uh, anxious and stressed out and very depressed about like, I'm still in a depressive funk where like it's effort to just get the regular things that I want to and need to get done on a daily basis. It's effort to do that. Uh, I just don't need the extra additional stress. All right. Anyway, uh, I want to talk about a couple of things today. Um, few people have pointed me, pointed me to this because they know I'm a Tulsi Gabbard fan, and I'll, I'll get to why that's pertaining to Tulsi in just a moment. Uh, but Unity 2020. Unity 2020. Uh, basically, this is like what people assumed the movement for a People's Party was doing, is that they were trying to run an alternative candidate uh, against the Democratic Party um, because, you know, fuck the Democratic Party. And I'm not saying that facetiously. I'm saying that as seriously as that. <laughs> fuck the Democratic Party. Uh, fuck the Republican Party. Fuck the duopoly. Like, I don't... Like, this is not... Um, so, a lot of people have been trying to come up with alternatives to the electoral politics. Alternatives to this duopoly that we are in. Um, and that's all fine and good. But here, this is part of the reason... Uh, I'm going to go through what... The background of what the... You know, this article for Unity 2020... Is, is talking about and then a couple of issues that I have with it. And, you know, I, what, again, like uh, this is not a 100% foolproof strategy, but something that could be done to maybe get, uh, you know, uh, a unity candidate, a unity 2020 candidate, or, or I guess just a unity candidate uh, on the ballots in 2024 or 2022. Um because I do think that there is a way to do it. It's just you have to kind of play the game to not play the game. Yeah, electoral politics is weird in that way, um, where you you have to be within it in order to break out of it. Um, you can't break out of it from it's it's complicated. I, I think I I think some of you might not understand what I'm saying. Anyway, uh, so the part of the thing that the Unity people point out is how ineffective the two-party system is, right? The two-party system is all about blaming the other side uh, for why things aren't getting done rather than trying to, like, work together to, to achieve uh, a mutual goal or, or just the goal of being a functioning government, um, which I don't think the Ameri like America has a functioning government right now. I think they have a performative government um, that, that wants to say nice things instead of actually do and put any action behind what they're talking about so uh, and, and you know a lot of what they point out the reason why they're ineffective is because the government is supposed to represent the people it's supposed to take care of its people when the people can't take care of themselves when large crises happen and I think you know a lot of people have been saying this for years um, you know is that a government controlled by corporate interests by greed and by profit is eventually going to be a failed state. And we saw the workings of that over the last, you know, 10, 15 years. Um, at, at minimum, it's, it's been going on for a long time. I mean, this is decades and decades of neoliberal policies, neoconservative policies uh, coming together to ensure, you know, which version of greed is it going to be? Is it going to be the pick yourself up by your bootstraps greed? Or is it going to be the greed that comes wrapped in a Black Lives Matter and a rainbow flag? Um, you know, to, to preserve appearances. Uh, so 
it'll commodify identity politics, put, put a price tag on identity politics, uh, sell merchandise with it. That's which version of that is going to be. So one of the things they point out is right now, the way that American politics has been running is that it's polarized. Um, it's, it's, it's heading us to, uh, you know, the, this second civil war type situation, which, hey, wasn't Joe Biden supposed to fix all that? What, didn't, didn't a lot of liberals say like, oh man, we're approaching a, a second civil war because of Trump and his rhetoric and da 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 da. But if Biden gets elected, all of that will be all of that will be fine. People will people will finally be able to breathe and come together uh, unified under a president that's all about unification. Uh, and here we are. I still see a bunch of people like talking about the, a potential of a civil war. And, and again, like it is still a possibility that a civil war. <laughs> will fucking happen uh very much a possibility uh you know like you do have these pro trumpers that are brandishing guns and capital steps and the cops ain't doing nothing to to stop them or uh, any such thing and you have pro like non-violent protests that are becoming violent because of police interference and you know it's like the cops are siding with militia and that, and now there's people on the left that are getting scared, so they're arming themselves, and uh, you know. So, and then you also have cops that are like supporting white supremacists and have white supremacists within their organization. Uh, but again, it's like the Biden presidency isn't going to solve that. I think the Biden presidency is going to uh, make it worse because here's the thing: what's done is done. There's been a polarization of America, and Donald Trump is one of the factors that led to it, but the other factor that led to it was basically the Democratic Party failing the people that it's supposed to represent. Supposedly. Supposedly they're supposed to represent. Um, Nancy Pelosi making performative shit like ripping up Donald Trump's State of the Union speech and giving him, you know, a sardonic fucking clap or Chuck Schumer making some kind of vapid fucking platitude statement over nothing when, you, you know, it's like the candidate that represents your party at its utmost is a vile racist piece of shit. And his VP candidate is also a vile individual that has put so many people behind bars. So, really what people need to realize is that it becomes an oligarchy... Uh, an issue between the oligarchy and the proletariat, right? Like, those are the words I'm going to use because that's what it is. Uh, it's a class war. That's all it really is. And and the problem is that people haven't realized that yet because people don't understand American history or American politics. Uh, they understand performance, and that's part of what politics is, is, is that it's a performance. Um, by the way, no one should be clamoring and excited about a fucking civil war. FYI. Uh, that is a bad thing for everybody. You should not be excited that that is a thing that could fucking happen. All right. Uh, they also point out something that I don't think a lot of people talk about, which is the correlation of legislation. Uh, basically, what that means, because I just said a bunch of gobbledygook uh, to some people, <laughs> right? What that means is there is a direct correlation between corporate interest and what gets legislated. So the more something, the, the more like the corporate oligarchs want something to happen, the more likely it is to happen. The more the people want something to happen, uh, the likelihood just doesn't stay the same. It's a flat line, right? Uh, you know, so uh, if people want um, Medicare for all, which is something that people do want. Uh, the likelihood of Congress making a legislation to approve Medicare for all will stay the same if people never said anything about Medicare for all at all. It stays about the same. But the likelihood that Medicare for all will become a platform that will be denied by Congress and a political party and so on and so forth uh, is directly correlated to whether corporate interests want Medicare for all or not. So the pharmaceutical industries don't want Medicare for all, so the parties will take a bold stance against Medicare for all. And this includes Democrats and the Republicans. The Democrats have come out and made that statement very clear that they are not for Medicare for all. So you have that. You have that going on. Uh, so 
what this thing comes out and says is that we need we need elect, elected officials that um, represent the full breadth of uh, the American political landscape because the American political landscape is not all Democrats and Republicans. Um, not even close, but but we're forced into playing that game where it is either Democrat or Republican, black or white, cold, hot or cold, you know. So uh, there's very, very few issues where it is this or that. So what the Unity 2020 folks have presented, and by the way, they already had their primaries and, and tried to get ballot access and all that kind of stuff. Uh, and I will get into that in just a moment here. But what what the Unity 2020 people are talking about is having a center left and a center right person run together. Uh, that would be the ticket, right? In, a, in in a traditional sense, it would be the president and vice presidential ticket. Uh, and the way that they would pick this person is: are they patriotic? Are they capable? And are they courageous? Those are the terms that they are going by. Uh, and they want to base a party off of cooperation and what they say is called necessary compromise. Those are the things that they stand for, right? So basically what we've outlined so far is where they're coming from and what they're looking for in a candidate. And this is all nice and good, but here's the problem. This does sound, this is very much sounds like centrism because you're center right, center right, center left. Uh, you know, the, the logical centrist kind of, you know, the moderates kind of uh, appearance to it. But the things that America wants are not center right, center left. Uh, they are progressive. They are they are what I believe is logical. Um, and it can be done with a competent government in place. Uh, we have not had a competent government in place because America's government is a p- political performative farce. Uh, center right, center left. Let's look at some of the things that people do want. People want Medicare for all. People wanted to fund the police. People want their student lo- uh, loans canceled. They want uh, rents canceled. They want debts canceled. Um, the the last couple, last two or three, are basically specifically during this pandemic. Uh, but if you're going to bail out the banks and give them a bunch of tax breaks and all that kind of shit, then you know what. I feel like they have enough money um, and they don't need my fucking monthly payment uh, or, or anybody else's. They, they can forgive a couple of the debts uh, and let people live their lives with the, with the things that they need. Uh, we want less wars. We want, uh, did I mention defunding the police? Yeah, this is all the things that they want. These are progressive policies. These are socialist ideologies, right? These are common sense type things logical issues and and this is and that's not what centrism is about right Uh, they talk about compromise and the question should be who is being compromised who is the compromise benefiting because so far American politics has compromised and it's compromised on the behalf of people the behalf of the American people and that really sucks And I think a lot of people are sick and tired of that. It's what pulls people away from politics. It's what makes politics so toxic. Um, Is, 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 you know, the the validation of these compromises against the people. And what I think we need to do now is compromise what the, the interests of corporations, the interests of the oligarchs. They've had their turn in the sun. They've, they've had too much of it. And, and, you know, if, if the electoral political landscape isn't going to shift in that direction, then the people will shift it in that direction. It's historically how it's happened all the time. Um, people will take to the streets. They will organize. They will march. They will amplify. Uh, they will educate themselves. And, uh, and they will push politics further to the f- further further to where it needs to be which is over or a little further to the left that's what benefits people I talk about patriotism and I mean that that has been code for nationalism that's been code for you know America first right like we're better than all the other countries MAGA 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 like that's that's what it's become I mean 
and, and under patriotism, like being a socialist is treasonous. When re- in reality, being a socialist just means that you want best for your uh, your your fellow citizens. You think outside of yourself. Patriotism doesn't allow that. Patriotism makes your identity your country, your identity your borders, the fake invisible lines that we live within. It forms tribalism. So I don't know if that's particularly the greatest interest. You should have somebody that is courageous, and you should have somebody that is bold enough to criticize the way that your country has been operating, to criticize the status quo, to go against your own parties, to go against the people that that you you consider a part of your tribe to sit there and say, wait a minute, I don't think our tribe is doing the right thing right now. I think this moral superiority and smugness is not good. That is courageous. Capability, yeah, okay, we should probably be looking for some younger folks, right? Uh, maybe bump down the fucking age to 30 to and go from like 30 to 65. What? the last couple of elections we've had to vote for you know we went from voting for someone younger and idealistic who ended up being a neoliberal shill Obama to a 70 year old man to another 70 year old like are we just that's not how this is supposed to fucking go so yeah, put an age limit. Make sure they're capable. Donald Trump isn't fucking capable. He's he's a, got a bevy of mental health issues. Uh, Joe Biden, not capable. Absolutely fucking not capable. Dude has dementia. His brain is failing. And they keep hiding that fact. And if you talk about it, they'll try to censor you about it. And they'll try to call you all these names and so on and so forth but it's like you're just gonna escape reality like you're just gonna be like no that's not a reality I wanna face I'm just gonna ignore it like the fact that we had two mentally unfit candidates running against each other to be the leader of an entire nation should tell you how much of a fucking failed state this 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 government system is this election system is and nobody should have been willing to participate in it unless they got more ca- more more parties involved and better candidates to vote for. Anyway. Um, so, yeah, okay. So, uh, the other issue that I have is ballot access, right? So, the Unit 20, uh, Unity 2020 means that you would have to spend uh, the remainder of the few months that you have trying to get ballot access in 50 different states in order to actually get the amount of votes that you get. And this is one of those things that people always chastise the third parties, right? Libertarians, independents, Green Party, what have you. They're like, oh, but you guys never get anything more than, you know, maximum of 3%. And that's, well, well, why is that? Well, that's because they don't have the ballot access. They don't have all of the tools that the Democrats and the Republicans have to, to market and get their word out. So if they're only in a handful of states, if they're only in one third of the states and they get 3% of the votes you know, they could easily get 10, 15, 20% of the votes and get federal funding for a bunch of shit if they were allowed to get ballot access. So that's a major challenge, which, which by the way, the Unity 2020 people did not get um, because they had their primary with ranked choice voting in August. Uh, and the two people that they chose were Chelsea Gabbard and Dan Crenshaw. Now, I think if you watch my channel enough that you know that I'm a, I'm a Tulsi Gabbard fan. I, although, I like her, what she represents in her ideologies. I am disappointed in her as a politician. Uh, because she turned out to just be bogus like all of the other politicians. And uh, as, as much as I didn't have the fervor to go at, like, to hate her as much as some other people did. And that's fine if, 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 if you were one of the people that did dislike her to the degree that, you know, some people did. I know Graham Elwood went, went off and Jimmy Dore tried and Ron Placone was pretty disappointed. I mean, everybody that really looked at Tulsi as a, as a progressive voice of, uh, uh, against American imperialism was. Uh, but, you know, I, I think what she represents is on point and it was really nice to see a, um, a, a, a candidate 
that uh, represented what I believed in. Um, same thing with Bernie Sanders, right? So Tulsi was chosen. And Dan Crenshaw is a Republican. I, I, and I'm, again, I'm not familiar with Dan Crenshaw. Uh, the only thing that I think uh, I, I have recollection of with Dan Crenshaw is... I can't, what's that comedian's name? He had a really fucking terrible special on Netflix. Uh, young kid from fucking SNL. Why am I blanking on his name? If you remember his name, leave a comment. Leave a comment about this guy. But he had a stand-up special. It's not very good. But he basically takes claim for making Dan Crenshaw famous. Um, but I think Crenshaw had his own fame before this kid made him famous on SNL. Uh, but, da- but you know, I, I know he's a Republican, and and but I don't know much else about this guy. Uh, for me to make a particular statement about him, of, of liking him or disliking him. Uh, but those were the two that were chosen, particularly, um, particularly because they fit the bill in ranked choice voting, and that's how it happened. Um, now, I think 2020 was a little short-sighted because the second Biden's nomination was in place, it was very clear, like, okay, I don't really have a dog in this race, right? I don't have a political political candidate in this race. And uh, my voice it becomes inapplicable because I'm not going to... I'm not going to talk within the little specified boxes that the establishment has put into place. What I think the unity people should do in order to get ballot access in order to get viable candidates is look at 2022 for lower, you know, down ballot, uh, replacements. Um, look at what MPP is doing and look, get, find a good presidential candidate for 2024. I mean, it could be Tulsi Gabbard, but the the electoral system, I mean, what really needs to happen and movement for a people's party is doing this is building um, a grassroots network. I mean, there's millions and millions of people that are turning on to movement for a people's party. You got Cornell West, Nina Turner, uh, Graham Elwood, Ryan Knight, you, you, you know, and, and I've had Nick Brenna on my podcast a couple times. I've talked about movement for a people's party quite a few times, numerous times. Right. Uh, I, I like what they're about. I like what they're doing. Um, solid folks. But Unity could do something with that. They could take the same amount of fervor and excitement surrounding a political party uh, and surrounding electoral politics and do something with it. And I think that's what they should aim for. And I'm not saying this in a way to be like, oh man, fucking MPP, look out, guys. No, I'm, I'm saying this like, yeah, Movement for a People's Party is is one of the options. And they're more of a socialist labor kind of party which is what we need we need a party that is representative of labor and we need an electoral system that doesn't just have us pick you know fucking political puppets to go up and be like i hope they represent the thing no i think the the whole thing should be transformed to the point where we should be talking about uh people voting on legislation And it should be easy to read. It shouldn't have all this fucking legalese. It should be easy to understand, easy to read. No fucking loophole bullshit. And the people should vote on those things. That's what I think a democracy should be. That's what I think America should do. And I'll talk more about that idea um, because there is somebody that's actually written about it and talked about it a lot more in depth um, and, I, and I'm going to talk about that later this week uh, but you know that's where we need to go we need to have more parties the Green Party should have ballot access the Libertarians, the People's Party this Unity Party, they should all have ballot access and they should all be able to get on the debate stage and they should all have uh, mainstream access I mean, honestly, at this point, with the way, if, if the momentum continues to grow, Move for People's Party is not really going to need mainstream access 
they'll just push for ballot access. And if the Democrats have a problem with that, then the Democrats come out looking like assholes that don't want progressives on the ballot because they're scared that the progressives are going to take votes away from them because the progressives are actually going to fucking stand for what the people actually fucking want. Meeting in the middle, this is part of the reason why I'm, I'm not fully on board with this, this unity party, though I think they should get ballot access, though I think they should exist as a political party, and they should run a good candidate, because it'll be a better alternative than the duopoly that's in place. Um, meaning in the middle, this talk about patriotism uh, usually winds up leaving people behind, because these ideas get co-opted. Uh, and unless you make a very specific thing to say necessary compromise, meaning we are going to compromise the benefits and rights of the uh, corporate oligarchs and not give them that many powers and restrain them and make sure that they are going to do the socially responsible thing, the morally right thing to do, uh, instead of be driven by greed and profit and all this other stuff. Uh, then, then yes, this compromise idea is going to work. What we really need is a major re-education process in America. A lot of people don't know uh, their own history. A lot of people don't understand uh, why things are the way they are. Uh, and when you point them out, when you talk about it, and when you, when you point out how this two-party system has really failed and why both parties are the bad guys here and why America itself... With its empirism, its uh, militarism, its its imperialism, uh, that it uh, you know enforces both at home and abroad, we're not the fucking good guys in this situation either. Um, it's it's rejected. It's put out into the fringes. People say, well, this is not the time for that. Things like that. Uh, and those are uh, very harmful in stopping all of this kind of stuff. But I do think that we need more parties and a major re-education in, uh, in America. Just not even re-education, just education. Just people to learn their own fucking history. By the way, there's plenty of stuff on this channel where you can dig into American history. I've talked about a bunch of stuff that isn't talked about in mainstream media or mainstream education. So, uh, yeah. Uh, next on the list, I want to talk about uh, Glenn Greenwald has left The Intercept. He has resigned from The Intercept. For those of you that might not know who Glenn Greenwald is, he is one of the co-founders of The Intercept. Um a, 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 a avid critique of uh, American imperialism, an avid critique of the uh, the deep state, uh, the uh, uh, privacy issue. Uh, sorry, I had a brain fart there. Um, he has talked a lot about Latin America, what's going on in Brazil, uh, revealing the corruption in, in Brazil. And really, if you look at that and you look at the American... Um, state of American politics, too. It's like, all right, but yeah, we're, we're, we're heading to becoming Brazil. So uh, why did he resign? Well, there's been a lot of censorship from his own organization in regards to uh, a lot of stuff that he's wanted to publish. And the, and the, and the uh, um, cherry on the cake, the, the straw that broke the camel's back, is writing about Biden. He was writing about Biden's, uh, the way Biden reacted to uh, everything that came out about Hunter Biden, which is something that I'm going to talk about as well. Um, again, later on this week, I will be addressing this issue of um, Joe and Hunter Biden and why Glenn Greenwald was censored and why Glenn Greenwald, uh, I mean, essentially lost, had to resign. Um, and, you know, uh, look elsewhere to, to be a, a journalist. Uh, an award-winning journalist, too, mind you. Like, this guy wasn't just like, oh, whatever. Like, no, this guy was like an award-winning journalist. Now, um, the folks at The Intercept, his partners at The Intercept, basically said we can't publish this. It has to be shorter. 
uh, and also let's let's not let's not bring any negative light on uh, on Joe Biden because that's not what we need right now. Um, you know that's th- th- this makes Joe Biden look bad and could in- could sway the election and he would lose. So we're just not going to publish this and we're just never going to bring this up again. And that level of censorship uh, was um, not something that uh, Glenn Greenwald was going to tolerate. And you know he went back and forth by email. And I'm going to uh, again later on this week I'm going to do a little bit of more of a deep dive on uh, you know the. Um, uh, the, the emails uh, that that he sent back and forth, and he basically said, "Look, I'm I have a little bit of carte blanche on in, in terms of like what uh, gets published, and I'm you know I'm one of the founders, uh, and and this is like important, and you guys are taking a political side, which is not what journalists are supposed to do, um, and he's had major issues, you know, he has pushed back on." Uh, people at his own publication, like he pushed back on James Risen a whole bunch uh, on the whole Russiagate issue because Risen, Risen was a big Russiagater, and you know Greenwald was basically like, we just we don't fucking have evidence to make this claim, and this is dangerous to do. Uh, and what happened? You know, Risen gets to stay on, the Russiagaters get to stay on, the 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 the, the people that. Uh, uh, push neoliberalism via the intercept get to stay on and this is very dangerous because it just kind of shows like there is political sway uh, in American journalism and when you come out and speak the truth and say hey we have to we have to hold our leaders feet to the fire that is important, and as journalists and as citizens, that's important, or else they'll, you know, get away with whatever they want. They don't have a social obligation to be good to the people. And right now, I mean, this is a big, this is a big deal, right? And and Greenwald has been pretty public about why he got let go. He wrote a piece on his Substack. Uh, but I have yet to see any Democrat, I- anybody from the Biden administration, come out and speak on journalistic integrity and you know fairness and accuracy and balance within journalism, and so on and so forth. They not not a peep, not a peep from them. And this isn't like some fringe group, right? I mean, a couple of years, uh, about a year or two ago, there were 700 uh, independent uh, journalist outlets that were just removed from Facebook and Twitter without any kind of warning, and it was like a major censorship. But a lot of them were, uh, a lot of them were smaller. They didn't have the same notoriety um, as Glenn Greenwald and The Intercept. So where where is that accountability, right? You 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 you, you uh, the Democrats screamed and jumped and 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 said, "Oh, this is a, a violation of press freedoms." When Jim Acosta was thrown out of uh, the White House press briefings, Jim Acosta is a fucking shill, by the way, and he's a bad journalist. He's not even a journalist. He's a fucking I don't even know what to call him. Like, he, like, entertainer? I don't really even know. But you have a shit journalist like Jim Acosta that gets thrown out of the White House uh, press briefing and, 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 and the Democrats lose their shit. And they're like, oh my God, oh my God, press freedom, press freedom, press freedom. But then a, a real journalist wants to publish something about your candidate with viable sources and and there's nothing from them just just silence if biden's supposed to be better than trump in terms of treatment of the press where is biden's response to how the intercept has treated one of their own there it, it doesn't exist 
And it really goes to show that that real journalists, uh, people with integrity that do reveal things about the powerful and do hold people that are so-called on their side uh, accountable and hold their feet to the fire, th these people don't care about that. They don't care about truth and holding people's feet to the fire. I just watched Ro Khanna uh, make excuses for you know supporting someone like Nancy Pelosi when he is so adamantly for Medicare for all, so anti-war as a politician. He was on Jimmy Dore and he was making all these excuses for he stands for this, that, and the third, but he's going to support the party because they don't want dissenters. The Democratic Party does not want any sort of dissent. They don't want anybody actually looking into them and saying, you guys are doing a bad job because they are. They want the same thing as Donald Trump. They want blind followers. This is, uh, you know, treading dangerous waters that this article was uh, suppressed at The Intercept. And I have to wonder what else was suppressed at The Intercept. Because, again, it's like that's a publication that I do like. They published the Blue Leaks. Um, they've, they've published, uh, they've, they've supported a lot of whistleblowers. So, you know. It, 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 it concerns me on a, on a uh, large level here that um, that something like this would happen at the intercept. Uh, yeah, uh, I think we're going to close for now. I think that's all. I, I wanted to talk about one other thing, but I think I'm going to save that for later. Uh, thank you guys for tuning in. You guys, have, I, I thank you for constantly supporting this shit. Uh, thank you for people that have become sustaining members. Thank you for for that. People that share this stuff. Thank you for that. People that watch it. Thank you. You guys are awesome. I know I'm going through a little bit of a a, a weird mental headspace and a little bit of turbulence. Uh, and hopefully I'll, I'm I'm going to be out of this little depressive weirdo funk that I'm in. Uh, soon sooner rather than later I, I, I hope uh, but you know thank you for supporting through it and I, and I do have a nice support system at home as well uh, so I don't want you guys to think that it's all depressive and everything but uh, with that being said we're going to bring this video to a close you guys know the deal like share subscribe follow me on Rockfin uh, you can donate become sustaining members if you have the ability to do so um, you get monthly you get cool shit monthly uh, and a uh, cool shit weekly, uh, subscribe to my email list, uh, and all of that stuff is available on my website, which is krishmohanhaha.com, K-R-I-S-H-M-O-H-A-N-H-A-H-A.com. Uh, all right. We'll see you on the next one. Bye guys.